Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guys? Yes, I do. Could you please give us your name? Jeffrey Epstein. Corruption. It comes in many forms. Theft, bribery, lies. Sometimes this corruption can lead to powerful people getting away with crimes. Unfortunately, the American people have grown accustomed to seeing politicians and the wealthy get away with all sorts of criminal and immoral acts. Where the average person might suffer a loss of reputation, monetary fines, or even jail time, the well-connected class are often able to weasel their way out. Whether we are talking of the Iran-Contra scandal in the 1980s, which found American military officials selling weapons to terrorists, the lies about Iraq's weapons, weapons of, of mass, mass destruction, destruction, the 2008 financial theft by the global banking elite, torture carried out by American soldiers at the orders of their superiors, corruption and violence from police on the local, state, and federal level, or the long history of indiscriminate bombing campaigns resulting in the deaths of millions of people in the Middle East. We'd go out and we'd find the guilty party, we'd put them on trial, and then lock them up. But 9-11 um, changed all that. It is clear that there is one set of rules for the people, the ruled, and one set of rules for those in government, media, banking, corporate entities, and their extremely wealthy financiers, aka the ruling class. A perfect example of this corruption can be found in the disturbing tale of Jeffrey Epstein, a convicted sex offender and billionaire who thus far has escaped any major consequences for performing sexual acts on teenage girls. Despite facing criminal charges a decade ago, Epstein was able to dodge any major repercussions in prison time. Now with a federal lawsuit looming on the horizon, the truth about Epstein may finally see the light of day. To date, this lawsuit and the chance to publicize the truth offers the best chance at bringing down Jeffrey Epstein. We are here in West Palm Beach. Behind me is the home of Jeffrey Epstein, a now convicted sex offender, billionaire. And it is in this home that more than a decade ago, more than 40 women, teenage women, alleged that he took them into this house for massages upstairs in that house where they were groped and molested by this man with the help of several other women. Now, Jeffrey Epstein continues to have this home as well as a home in Paris, in New York, a ranch in New Mexico, and his private island called Little St. Jeff. But this is the home where the whole story began, and this is the story that we are going to dive into today. Starting in the 1970s, Epstein worked as an options trader and financial advisor for investment banker Bear Stearns. Epstein has been a prominent member of the ruling class for decades, sometimes advising high-profile people on tax strategies. He has rubbed elbows with and hosted parties with Hollywood celebrities, including Alec Baldwin, Elizabeth Hurley, Dustin Hoffman, and Kevin Spacey, hung out with musicians like Courtney Love, politicians like Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, and Henry Kissinger, and royalty such as Britain's Prince Andrew, Duke of York. Epstein is a member of the ruling class who are so arrogant they feel safe committing crimes because they know full well they can buy off judges, lawyers, and even their opponents. If that doesn't work, lawsuits can be filed to scare individuals away from pursuing justice. And if that doesn't work, threats of physical harm can be used. It has been reported that many of Epstein's famous friends have flown on his private plane, known as the Lolita Express, to attend his infamous parties on his island, nicknamed Little St. Jeff. Despite Epstein's best efforts, the public learned about his secret affinity for young girls in the mid-2000s. In 2005, the Palm Beach County Police were contacted by the mother of a 14-year-old girl who said she was paid $300 to strip down to her underwear and massage Jeffrey Epstein at his Palm Beach residence. This led to an 11-month investigation, which eventually involved the FBI. Law enforcement gathered evidence of up to 40 young girls participating in Epstein's massage scheme and eventually conducted a raid on his Palm Beach home. According to court documents, Epstein's one-time girlfriend and partner in crime, Jill Zane Maxwell, helped the billionaire connect to local teenage girls via a teenager named Haley Robson. Robson reportedly recruited friends and other teenagers from the local schools to participate in the massages at Epstein's house. Epstein apparently targeted girls from lower-income neighborhoods. Nada Marcinkova and Sarah Kellen are two other women who have also been accused of helping feed Epstein's pedophilic urges. One of the victims told police that she had been told Epstein purchased Marcinkova from her parents in Eastern Europe when she was only 15 years old. The young woman who first alerted her parents about Epstein's activities is known in court documents as Jane Doe No. 1. I was 14 years old when I met Jeffrey Epstein. I came in contact with him through Haley Robson. And 
That's basically it. She introduced me to him when I was a freshman in high school. Looking back now, I know that she was, uh, it was her job to do that. But at the time, I just thought she was just trying to be a cool, older role model and show, like, show me an easy way to make a couple of hundred dollars. Statements from the women each describe a very similar story. First, they would be welcomed into the house, invited upstairs to Epstein's room where a massage table awaited. Epstein would walk out of the bathroom in a towel and lay down on the massage table, sometimes face up, sometimes face down, and request a massage from the girls. He often told them to strip naked before beginning the massage. Some of the girls report complying with his demands, while others did not. While Epstein was laying down receiving his massage, he would often begin to masturbate. Occasionally, he would pull out a white vibrator from a dresser near the table and attempt to poke and rub the teenage girls with the device. And then he came in the room and just a towel and laying down and then told me to give him a massage and in the middle of my massage then told me to just take off my bra. He tried small talk, you know, get to know me, try to make it less awkward because I think he could tell maybe that I just wasn't feeling very comfortable. Once he started small talk, I opened up a little bit. I got a little bit more comfortable, wasn't as awkward. Um, and then, then he started telling me about his personal life, how he became, well, that's what he told me, how, how he became to where he was today. New York is where he said that he got all of his business. He said he, he always was bragging about his girlfriends, different girlfriends, especially like one situation in particular with a female that he was dating in New York City that was young you know, to the point where the parents would have to come on a date with them. When I met him, I just compared him to my father. So definitely in his 30s or 40s, he was he already had gray hair. I mean, he didn't look young at all. He was telling me about all the different places he travels. He told me about his jet. Uh, he told me that he flew girls different places, you know, those kind of things. He never exactly said that how much money he was worth or anything of the sort. In fact, I didn't even know how wealthy he really was until everything came out in the open. Some of the girls reported that Epstein took a particular liking to them and would invite them back often. One girl stated that she was forced to have sex with Marcin Kova and watch her have sex with Jeffrey Epstein. The girls that Epstein favored the most, however, were taken on flights aboard his private jet to parties on his private island, where they claim they participated in sex parties. Some of Epstein's famous and wealthy friends were present and allegedly participating in sexual acts with these young girls. Despite all of these statements from more than 40 women and evidence gathered from Epstein's home, the billionaire would escape with barely a scratch. In May 2006, the Palm Beach police filed a probable cause affidavit for four counts of unlawful sexual activity with a minor. However, by the end of the summer, the federal government would offer Epstein a non-prosecution agreement and he would be allowed to plead guilty to a single charge of felony solicitation of prostitution. In 2007, New York Magazine reported the following about the case. The Palm Beach police had brought stacks of evidence across the waterway to the Palm Beach County State Attorney's Office, but the state attorney apparently saw the main witnesses as weak. One had run away from home, lied about her age, and bragged about her ass on MySpace. Another had a drug arrest and had stolen from Victoria's Secret. The police wanted numerous felony charges against Epstein, as well as charges against Haley Robson and Sarah Kellen. Then they heard that the state attorney was preparing a deal with Epstein, giving him five years on probation and sending him for psychiatric evaluation. The police chief, Michael Ryder, accused the state attorney of bending over backward for a rich man and then turned the matter over to the FBI. As part of this non-prosecution agreement, Epstein was ordered to pay multi-million dollar settlements to victims and sentenced to 18 months of jail, of which he only served 13. Federal prosecutors are now answering to allegations they let convicted pedophile Jeffrey Epstein off the hook in 2008. In 2007, before Epstein's trial, which landed him in jail for 13 months, the billionaire was let off the hook for federal charges. The deal has been referred to as a sweetheart deal. The deal may have violated the Crime Victims Rights Act. For more on this tonight, we turn to Mike Papantonio, host of America's Lawyer. This was a sweetheart deal that was done secretly. I mean, the only way to describe this is it was a secret deal done by the federal government, by the federal prosecutors. U.S. Attorney Marie uh, Filifano uh, actually engaged in the deal. And with that deal, she gave a sentence 
that ordinarily would have landed most people in prison for life. The sentence was a non-prosecution where Epstein went to jail for, uh, for 13 months. And here's the real sticker. He didn't really go to jail. He was allowed to go free 16 hours a day, six days a week. So basically, the deal was he got to sleep in a prison cell at night. This was Epstein, and he was a multi-billionaire who had a, if you look down, uh, you, you look down his, his list of who I know, it is the who's who around yeah. the world. And so, so all of a sudden, he gets this free pass. Epstein was allowed to stay in the Palm Beach County Jail in his own private cell where he was allowed to leave six days a week for 16 hours a day for work release. Epstein was forced to register as a sex offender for life, but with his money and his connections, he doesn't seem too bothered. In addition to Epstein getting off, his helpers, Nada Marcinkova and Sarah Kellen, were also allowed to go free as part of the non-prosecution agreement. The women were identified by U.S. federal prosecutors as, quote, potential co-conspirators who were allowed to avoid charges. In 2015, it was reported that the women had reinvented themselves as Nadia Marcinko and Sarah Kensington and were running businesses out of New York City properties owned by Epstein's brother, Mark. Other allegations against Epstein include a story of him being presented with three 12-year-old girls from France as a birthday gift. The girls were reportedly recruited from South America, Europe, and Eastern Europe for his sexual pleasure. It was alleged that many of the girls brought to Epstein were funneled via MC2, the modeling agency owned by Jean-Luc Brunel, a longtime acquaintance of Epstein, who has recently been accused of rape by several former models. The Civil Suit Against Epstein In 2008, following Epstein's plea agreement, attorney Bradley Edwards filed suit against the U.S. government, claiming the feds failed to involve the victims in the settlement, an obligation required by the Crime Victims' Rights Act. Edwards was one of the lawyers representing the women who brought the original suit against Epstein. He has been working to convince a federal judge to reopen the investigation into Epstein, alleging that more evidence remains to be uncovered. In 2015, U.S. District Judge Kenneth Mara sided with the U.S. Attorney's Office and Epstein in asserting that the 15,000 pages of documents must remain private. The women behind the suit state that they believe Epstein's connections helped him get his sweetheart prison deal. This speculation may be accurate, especially in light of recently released documents which indicate that Epstein may have cut a deal with the FBI. In 2018, the FBI released hundreds of new documents onto their online depository, The Vault. Some of these documents relate to the case against Epstein. One memo from September 18, 2008 states, On September 11, 2008, case agent advised Ryder that Epstein is currently being prosecuted by the state of Florida and is complying with all conditions of his plea with the state of Florida Epstein has also provided information to the FBI as agreed upon. Case agent advised that no federal prosecution will occur in this matter as long as Epstein continues to uphold his agreement with the state of Florida. Additionally, in 2015, Politico reported that court documents released through litigation appeared to show prosecutors cooperating with Epstein's lawyers to keep the deal secret. Assistant U.S. Attorney Marie Villafana used her personal Gmail account to suggest to one of Epstein's lawyers that they file legal papers in a different jurisdiction as a way to, quote, hopefully cut the press coverage significantly. Villafana told Epstein's attorneys that she would, quote, include our standard language regarding resolving all criminal liability, and I will mention co-conspirators, but I would prefer not to highlight for the judge all of the other crimes and all the other persons that we could charge. Edwards and Paul Cassell filed a court document in response to the revelations, stating that the, quote, victim's allegations of a conspiracy between the government and Epstein's attorney to conceal the existence of a broad non-prosecution agreement are not mere speculation, but appear to be well supported. The suspicion of improper deal-making is one of the key reasons these women and Bradley Edwards have fought for this lawsuit for the last 10 years. With Jeffrey Epstein, the billionaire who pleaded guilty in 2005 to soliciting a 14-year-old girl for sex, may be facing a new slew of charges, thanks to a renewed push to have that guilty plea thrown out. As we've been reporting, Epstein is facing allegations of sexually abusing at least 40 underage girls at his private island, Little St. James, an island where former President Bill Clinton made dozens of trips by taking Epstein's private jet. Also connected to this scandal, Prince Andrew, the Duke of York, and famed lawyer Alan Dershowitz. Epstein has had a barrage of attorneys fighting for him in an attempt to get the lawsuit dismissed, including Harvard Law professor and friend of Epstein, Alan Dershowitz, 
who has also been accused of being involved in Epstein's sexual deviance. If you ask me about my legal relationship with Epstein, obviously it's covered by lawyer-client privilege, but anything else I'll be happy to answer. Dershowitz went from publicly denying any involvement with Epstein's massages or sex parties to eventually admitting he did receive a massage, but claimed nothing illegal happened. The claims against Dershowitz come from an additional alleged victim known as Jane Doe No. 3 or Virginia Roberts. In January 2015, it was reported that Roberts and a Jane Doe No. 4 filed motions in court seeking to be added to the ongoing case fought by Bradley Edwards. The women's allegations matched that of earlier victims. Epstein worked with women to lure in young girls who would be paid to massage his back and chest while he masturbated and poked the girls with a vibrator. He often groped the young girls while they gave the massages. However, the claims of Roberts and Jane Doe No. 4 went further than the previous women. The motion claims that Epstein was running a, quote, sexual abuse ring where he loaned out underage girls to, quote, prominent American politicians, powerful business executives, foreign presidents, a well-known prime minister, and other world leaders. In 2015, The Guardian also reported that Roberts claimed the U.S. government was holding back evidence of her time as a sex slave for Epstein. Roberts said the FBI and federal prosecutors are part of a, quote, major cover-up. Although she has been largely dismissed, both in court and by the media, The Guardian notes that Roberts filed previously undisclosed receipts for a flight from New York to Thailand in September 2002, which was paid for by J. Epstein. Virginia Roberts claims by the age of 16, she was forced into a life of sexual servitude. She claims to have been brought into Epstein's inner circle, flying in his private jet to his ranch in New Mexico, his private island, and his mansion in New York. Roberts said she was sexually exploited and assaulted, quote, by politicians and businessmen. Epstein settled the lawsuit out of court by paying Roberts an undisclosed sum. Now Roberts is among the women trying to get Epstein's non-prosecution agreement overturned. Birds of a Feather with all of the allegation of Epstein being connected to politicians, businessmen, and royalty, it's important to take a moment to highlight some of the people connected to the convicted sex offender. In January 2015, the Daily Mail reported that it had obtained a copy of Jeffrey Epstein's address book, which contained the list of all of his associates. Following the Daily Mail's report, Gawker released a copy of the address book. The address book came from Epstein's former house manager, Alfredo Rodriguez, who was arrested in 2009 after attempting to sell the address book. Rodriguez said he pulled the address book off of Epstein's computer. In court documents, Bradley Edwards refers to the address book as a holy grail. Rodriguez would be sentenced to 18 months in prison, five more months than Epstein, before he died in December 2014 from cancer related to exposure to asbestos. He was never able to speak out publicly about the true importance of the names he circled in the book. About 50 names were circled by Rodriguez, including Courtney Love and Donald Trump. Other names in the address book included Barbara Walters, Alec Baldwin, Sir Richard Branson, Dustin Hoffman, Bobby Kennedy Jr., Senator Edward Kennedy, and Henry Kissinger. Although it is widely reported that both the Clintons and Donald Trump have connections to Jeffrey Epstein, the existence of the address book has mostly been ignored. According to flight logs obtained and released in 2015, Bill Clinton flew on the Lolita Express 26 times. Beyond simply appearing in Epstein's little black book, however, Trump was also accused of raping a teenage girl who he met through Epstein. Katie Johnson, also known as Jane Doe, filed three different lawsuits against Trump in 2016, claiming that she was 13 when she first met Epstein and began participating in sex parties involving older men. Johnson claimed that Trump sexually assaulted her in 1994 at one of Epstein's parties. She was 13 at the time. Johnson said she decided to come forward once she realized Trump was running for president. However, in November 2016, Johnson abruptly canceled a planned press conference in which she was going to reveal her identity and instead withdrew her lawsuit. Trump's attorneys claimed that there did not exist any corroborative evidence to prove Johnson's claims. In 2016, Lisa Bloom, one of the attorneys representing Johnson, wrote that her claims were, quote, consistent with prior sexual misconduct claims against Epstein and are backed up by an eyewitness and thus should be taken seriously. However, shortly after Johnson voluntarily dismissed the claims, the Daily Mail reported that an anonymous source had evidence that Johnson had made the whole thing up. Also, in December 2017, The Hill reported that leaked text messages from Lisa Bloom indicate that she attempted to reach out to TV networks and political action committees connected to Hillary Clinton during the 2016 presidential election to see if they would be interested in paying for information related to Trump's alleged involvement with Johnson. 
Another important connection between Donald Trump and Jeffrey Epstein is the fact that Alexander Acosta, Trump's appointment to labor secretary, is the same attorney who helped seal Epstein's non-prosecution agreement. In the spring of 2017, former Miami U.S. attorney Alexander Acosta was nominated by Donald Trump and approved by the U.S. Congress. When Acosta was questioned during his nomination hearing regarding his role in Epstein's deal, he downplayed the collusion and claimed that there might not be enough evidence to convict Epstein. Acosta also wrote that he was subject to a, quote, year-long assault on the prosecution and the prosecutors by a, quote, army of legal superstars who investigated him and his family looking for any way to disqualify him. Whether he was a willing participant or strong-armed into the agreement, Acosta helped Epstein reach a plea deal that allowed him to get away with the victimization of dozens of young girls. I think the committee needs to ask about, and I think you're entitled to respond to an article that appeared in the Washington Post online version last night uh, and this morning, and I'm just going to read the opening to it. I'm going to ask you some questions because I think you deserve an opportunity to address it. Uh, Labor nominee Acosta cut deal with billionaire guilty in sex abuse case. Um, just the first three paragraphs, and then I'll introduce the article into the record. There was once a time before the investigations, before the sexual abuse conviction, when rich and famous men loved to hang around with Jeffrey Epstein, a billionaire money manager who loved to party. They visited his mansion in Palm Beach, Florida. They flew on his jet to join him at his private estate on the Caribbean island of Little St. James. They even joked about his taste in younger women. President Trump called Epstein a terrific guy back in 2002, and saying that, quote, He's a lot of fun to be with. It's even said that he likes beautiful women as much as I do, and many of them are on the younger side, close quote. Now, Trump is on the witness list in a Florida court battle over how federal prosecutors handled allegations that Epstein, 64, sexually abused more than 40 minor girls, most of whom between the ages of 13 and 17. The lawsuit questions why Trump's nominee for labor secretary, former Miami U.S. Attorney Alexander Acosta, whose confirmation hearing is scheduled to begin Wednesday, cut a non-prosecution deal with Epstein a decade ago rather than pursuing a federal indictment that Acosta's staff had advocated. And I'd like to introduce the article for the record, Mr. Chair. In March 2017, Newsweek reported that an unnamed former prosecutor suggested Acosta was, quote, pretending the failure to prosecute was routine, but that's bullshit. The anonymous prosecutor stated, quote, what happened here was completely and totally out of the main. Prosecutors wanted badly to prosecute this guy. decided as U.S. Attorney to cut a non-prosecution deal, uh, that part of the decision was that that non-prosecution deal be held private, not appear in the public record. And there's an allegation that I just read that um, you did not pursue a federal indictment even though your staff had advocated that you do so. Is that accurate? Um, that is not accurate. Let me, um, let me address the, um, you know, and the, um, you know, one of the difficulties with uh, matters before the Department of Justice is that... Finally, attorney Bradley Edwards filed an affidavit which claims that Trump called Epstein's West Palm Beach mansion on several occasions during the time period of the women's charges against Epstein and was a regular guest at the mansion. Edwards also notes that 14 phone numbers for Donald Trump, including emergency numbers, car numbers, and numbers to Trump's security guard and housemen, were found in Epstein's address book. We, early on, uh, had discussions within the office, and we decided that, um, that a sentence, or, or uh, how should I put this, that Mr. Epstein should plead guilty to two years, register as a sex offender, and concede liability so the victims could get restitution. And if that were done, the federal interest would be satisfied, and we would defer to the state. Um, that was very early on in the case. Um, I, I say that because the article goes on to talk about um, uh, a view that the U.S. Attorney's Office was not aggressive in this matter. Can I and, read, can I read uh, one, uh, one other statement from the article? Federal prosecutors detailed their findings in an 82-page prosecution memo and a 53-page indictment, but Epstein was never indicted. And then there's a quote, quote, this agreement, the agreement you described, will not be made part of any public record, the deal between Epstein and Acosta says. There's definitely more to this story than what has been released to the public. The evidence points to Epstein using his connections to get out of prison time. He is simply too connected to powerful people to be brought down. And if the allegations are true, that Epstein secretly recorded these sex parties, 
He may have plenty of dirt on many of the world's most powerful people. Hopefully, the people of the world will learn the truth, and perhaps Epstein's victims can rest a little easier knowing that the truth is out. However, based on past experience, Epstein will likely try to settle the suit out of court or simply use his minions to threaten witnesses until they back off. Unfortunately, Epstein is only one piece of this puzzle. It is impossible for him to carry out these acts alone. He works with a variety of people to feed his despicable habit. If the allegations are even partially true, then many powerful people are involved in pedophilia and potentially trafficking of human beings. In the next documentary, we will explore this network of individuals and groups who contribute to this dark side of humanity. Only by choosing to shine a light on these horrible tragedies and crimes can we ever hope to put an end to them. Thank you for watching. This is Derek Bros with the Conscious Resistance.